we enter into his treatment of the theme of the high priesthood of Jesus. It's the theme upon which everything else hangs in the letter, and it's the theme upon which everything else hangs in the matter of our salvation. Jesus saves us as our great high priest. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us today. And Jonathan, for the person who's maybe not super familiar with the Old Testament and they hear you say Jesus saves us as, as a great high priest, what does that mean? You're absolutely right that we need a little bit of Old Testament background to make sense of what we're learning here in this portion of Hebrews. But the concept of the high priest was absolutely central to Old Testament religion and to engaging with with the God of Israel. There was an understanding in the Old Testament, taught clearly in the Old Testament, that there is distance between God and humanity because of human wrongdoing, human rebellion, human sin. And we needed uh, an intermediary to bring us to God. And that intermediary would have as a core part of his role the work of making sacrifices for sin before God. And so the work of the high priest, if human beings were to have anything to do with the God of heaven, the work of the high priest was absolutely central. And so how do we see Jesus fulfilling that role as the high priest? Well, the New Testament teaches us that Jesus fulfills the great offices of the Old Testament, the office of prophet, of priest, and of king, and we could think about each one of those in turn, and it would be a very, very fascinating study, I'm sure. But the focus here in Hebrews 5 is that Jesus fulfills the office of priest. He is the great high priest because he not only goes into the presence of God the Father as an intermediary, but he brings the great sacrifice, not the sacrifice of an animal, but the sacrifice of himself. And it's an extraordinary thing to consider. Well, we consider that today from the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 5. Grab a Bible. Join us there as we begin our message, our great high priest. Here is Jonathan. Well, with the rise of the internet, I guess we all know the world of travel has radically changed. If you can remember back this far, in the old days when planning for a vacation, you might go to your local travel agent or the CAA store. You'd look through all those guidebooks, the beautiful guidebooks that were all across the walls. And once you'd browsed for a while, a professional travel advisor would invite you to sit down at their desk and they would talk you through the options and then book you into what would probably be a brand name hotel somewhere, a Holiday Inn or a Ramada or something like that. But of course, nowadays, the options have multiplied and the internet has allowed us to take a more direct and less conventional approach through the likes of Airbnb and all the rest, you can bypass the travel agent altogether, you can bypass the big established brands, and you can try something new, something direct, something a little bit more off-grid if you want to. But however exciting it may be to try something unique, the experience can be just a little bit nerve-wracking as well. You know, you're dealing with an unknown quantity. The online reviews, they look pretty good, but are they genuine? You've got an email address for the owner, but are they legit? Does this person even exist? You've got a door code to punch in on arrival, but will it actually open the door to this place when you get there at 11 at night after a long journey with a car full of tired kids? At the heart of the gospel is the promise that if we trust in Jesus Christ, our great high priest and his blood shed for us, if we do that, then when we reach the end of our journey, we will be welcomed into God's heavenly dwelling as his people, as his children, even as his friends. If we place ourselves into the hands of Jesus by faith, if we place our confidence in him, then all will ultimately be well when we reach our final destination. Now, that is the claim, that is the promise of the gospel. But for the Jewish background believers for whom Hebrews was first written, well, for them, this all seemed just a little bit risky. It was new. It felt like a bit of an experiment. And they were just beginning to wonder if it was all going to turn out okay in the end. People around them were saying something like this to them. Look, look, there is a, a known establishment, a trusted establishment down the street that is going to meet all your spiritual needs. 
if you will but return to God's official agents at the temple, to those trustworthy priests of old, they will make all the arrangements for you. They will make spiritual provision for your journey so that you will be welcomed into heaven upon your arrival. Come back to the temple. Come back. Come back to the official priests. Come back to one of the Levites where they will do what they've always done. They will bring you near to the very presence of God. That's the way it's always been done. That's the safe thing. That's the prudent thing. That is the wise thing. Won't you come back? Now, that's the kind of pressure that we imagine these believers were under. But here in chapter 5, with the background of all that pressure and those questions in the writer's mind, he wants to show them and he, he wants to show us that we have a priest who is very real but whom we cannot see but for the eyes of faith. We have a priest who serves in heaven above but one who is truly qualified and truly able to bring us into the very presence of God, who is able even to offer us an eternal salvation. We, we can't see Him only with the eyes of faith right now, but we need to trust Him. We need to trust that when the journey is done, we're not going to be disappointed. We're not going to be let down. That's the great burden of the passage that's before us this morning. And, and here in chapter 5, we enter into what is really the doctrinal heart, the teaching heart of the whole book of Hebrews. We enter into his treatment of the theme of the high priesthood of Jesus. It's the theme upon which everything else hangs in the letter, and it's the theme upon which everything else hangs in the matter of our salvation. Jesus saves us as our great high priest. Now, the writer has for us three lessons about this vital theme, three lessons about the high priesthood of Jesus, three lessons which I trust will ultimately be for our assurance, three lessons which I hope will move us to entrust ourselves afresh to Jesus. Here's the first one. Jesus was appointed high priest. Jesus was appointed. He didn't appoint Himself. Just occasionally, slightly unhinged people come on, on the scene and appoint themselves to high office and give themselves grandiose titles. Perhaps the most colorful of such characters in modern history was a man by the name of Joshua Abraham Norton. He was a failed businessman in the San Francisco area in the early 19th century who, when his business ventures ultimately came to nothing, proclaimed himself to be Norton I, emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico. Currency was issued in his name, I gather, and he made numerous very interesting proclamations, including one calling for the dissolution of Congress by force. Now, he wasn't taken all that seriously in his time, but he was evidently very well liked. And when he died quite suddenly, I gather that 10,000 people lined the streets of San Francisco to pay their respects. One potential line of criticism against Jesus at the time of Hebrews was simply this. He was simply a self-appointed maverick. He's just assumed this role of Messiah. That's bad enough. But not only that, he has now taken on, he has appropriated the office of priest as well. And that's a very serious charge and a serious concern. The office of priesthood in Israel, it's not something that you can just saunter your way into. It's not something that you can choose to do at the college careers fair. You can't just rent a stall in the local marketplace and put out your own shingle, priest of God Most High. No, to be legit, to be a true priest, you need to be appointed by God. That's the way this thing goes. And Hebrews readily acknowledges the special nature of the job and the importance of the appointment process. Just notice the opening verses of chapter 5 again. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Then down to verse 4. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Now that point is very basic, it's important, and no one's really going to disagree with it. Priests who represent God to the people and the people to God, who make sacrifices for sins and, and all the rest of it, they don't choose themselves, never have, could, never could. No, they are appointed by God just as Aaron was. 
Aaron, the brother of Moses, appointed by God to serve as the first priest in Israel, he and members of his family, the great tribe of Levi, they would be given this unique privilege of serving as priests before God. Nightmare stories are emerging all the time, all too often, of fraudsters who claim to be doctors, who manage to perform medical procedures on unsuspecting patients, and who are later revealed to be total imposters. There's the story of the fake neurosurgeon who caused a life-threatening infection in a patient in Toronto. There's a story of a teenager in Vancouver posing as a doctor and offering Botox injections to unsuspecting members of the public. And there was a woman in Montreal, perhaps you heard of this a few years ago, who caused distress and mayhem on hospital wards by posing as a doctor and giving out fraudulent medical advice and diagnoses. The thought of a fake, self-appointed doctor is undoubtedly terrifying. The thought of an illegitimate priest of God, well, that is actually far more serious. A doctor cares for the body, and that's important. The priest, though, deals with the soul. The priest's work impacts the eternal destiny of the people. And recognizing the seriousness of the job, Hebrews now wants to assure us that Jesus is indeed legitimate. He is appointed by God Himself, verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt Himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by Him who said to Him, You are My Son, today I have begotten you. As He says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In verses 5 and 6 here in the passage, the writer quotes from two Old Testament Psalms, which he insists prove to us that Jesus was indeed appointed by God, appointed to be a priest. The writer sees in these Old Testament Psalms the very words of God the Father, words of appointment that He speaks to Jesus the Son, making Him, appointing Him to be priest of, priest of God Himself. These were words written down in the Scriptures centuries before, but words intended to be fulfilled when the Son of God should come on the scene. Now, to follow what the writer is doing here, to follow the point that he's making, we need to remember just a few basic facts about Jewish hopes for the Messiah who would come. The Old Testament, you'll know, spoke again and again of a coming king who would rescue the people of Israel from their enemies and restore them to the full blessings of God, blessings of a kingdom, blessings of land, blessings of protection, and so on. This promised and coming king, well, he was called the Messiah. Now, the Jewish converts reading Hebrews, they had accepted that Jesus was indeed the Messiah who would come. I don't think they were questioning that basic truth. But the issue that troubled them at this point was this. Could this Messiah actually deal with their spiritual needs before God? Could He actually address the problem of their sin and the defilement that it brought? Could He actually bring them into the very presence of God? That's the question. That's the thing that's concerning them. Their friends at the synagogue and the temple, well, they were evidently telling them that He couldn't do that, telling them that if they wanted to be spiritually secure, well, they still needed to come to God by the old means, the old-fashioned way, through the Levitical priests at the temple, through the sacrifices and through the offerings that they made there. After all, they might have said, look, the Messiah's job was a political and a military job. It wasn't a spiritual one in this sense. The Messiah is a king. He's not a priest. You can trust in Jesus as your Messiah all you want to if you like, but you need to show up at the temple if your sins are going to be forgiven, if your guilt is going to be dealt with, if God is going to accept you on that final day. Now, against the background of these objections and these arguments, the writer has something really quite profound to show us from the Scriptures. He means to show us, he intends to show us that God always planned, always intended, long ago promised that His Messiah King would at the very same time be His saving priest. This is Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called Our Great High Priest as we look at Hebrews chapter 5 today. Hope you make it a point to stay with us as we continue to look at what the writer of Hebrews has to say about this vital theme of Jesus being our great high priest. Well, if you know you can't be by your radio each and every time Jonathan's teaching is on the air, you don't have to miss it. 
You can come to our website and you can listen online. Stop by EncounterTheTruth.org and there you can stream the program or download an MP3 that uh, you can listen to whenever it fits your schedule. Again, our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. All right, back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. He begins there in verse 5 by quoting perhaps the most famous messianic psalm of all the psalms, Psalm 2, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You may remember he quoted it previously back in chapter 1, and we spent some time looking at it together then. We don't need to turn back to that, but Psalm 2 points to the day of enthronement of the messianic king, the great king in Zion, a king who would be given dominion over the whole earth, a king whom God would call his own son. Now, by this point in Hebrews, by this point in the argument of Hebrews, it is a settled fact that Jesus is that king. He is the promised Messiah. He is declared by God to be His Son and ruler, now ascended on high and seated at the right hand of the Father in the place of supreme authority. Applying Psalm 2 to Jesus, that's not very controversial for these believers, but the really controversial claim comes in verse 6. Here the writer quotes for us another psalm, once again about the promised King, but full of surprise. I think we need to turn to this one. It's, it's very fascinating, and it's very important. This is Psalm 110. Let me just read the first few verses of it. We're told it's a Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, Psalm 110 in verse 1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In ancient Israel, it was an important feature of the nation's leadership that key offices were held by different people and not all concentrated in one individual. That's true to a greater or lesser extent in many modern nations. The simplest example for us here in Canada are the offices of head of state and head of government. The prime minister is the head of government, but the queen is head of state, as you know, represented by the governor general. Now, it's important to our system of governance that those offices are kept separate, that they are held by different individuals. In ancient Israel, the three great offices were the office of prophet, priest, and king. The, the king, he, he didn't perform priestly duties. The priest, well, he didn't rule. And the prophet often had the important job of bringing the warnings and encouragements of the Word of God to the king in particular, three separate offices. But one of the great lessons that Hebrews wants to drive home for us is that the Son of God who was sent into the world, who became man, who lived, who died, who rose, who ascended again, He came to be prophet, priest, and king. In Him, all the great offices of leadership would come together and find their ultimate fulfillment. We saw this in chapter 1, actually, with the whole discussion of God's speech. Remember how the letter opened. We are told right back at the beginning that God spoke at former times and in various ways through the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us in His Son. And, and, and so the message there is that the prophetic role and the prophetic office finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. And then the writer goes on immediately in chapter 1 to show us that this promised Son, who is the speaker of God's Word, is also the Messiah King. Well, now comes the greater surprise. The promised Messiah King would also be the priest. It's an especially surprising idea because in a famous incident in the Old Testament, King Saul takes it upon himself to offer a priestly offering. And because he engages in that kind of overreach, he, he shouldn't have done it, the kingdom is actually taken away from him. That's Saul's great downfall. It, it's a serious thing for a king in Israel to wander into the priest's territory and into the priest's role. Within the Old Testament experience of the people of God, the two offices don't overlap. It would be like our prime minister moving into Rideau Hall. It wasn't to be done. It shouldn't be done. 
the idea that the Messiah King would also be the priest, that's surprising. But the writer wants us to see that this is no modern invention. It's not the invention of the apostles or anyone else. No, it was set out as the plan of God and the intention of God in Psalm 110. You see, here is a psalm which is quite clearly and explicitly about the king. Just look at verse 2 again. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. It's the king's scepter for the purposes of ruling. And then the instruction, rule in the midst of your enemies. The psalm, it speaks of a king to come, even the Messiah himself. That much is clear, but then the surprise of verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The king to be appointed by God through an oath is also to be appointed priest. Now, we're going to come back to the question of this chap, Melchizedek, in a couple of weeks when we look at him in chapter 7. That's where the focus really lands on him. He is very, very interesting, but we're just going to have to park that. We're going to have to file that just for a moment. But the basic point here at the opening of chapter 5 is that the Messiah was always going to be a priest as well as a king, right there in the Old Testament Scriptures. No invention, no sleight of hand, no trickery, right there in black and white. That's the first great truth about the high priesthood of Jesus, and it reassures us that Jesus is actually qualified, actually able to serve as high priest, and so He actually can save us. He actually can bring us into the presence of God Himself. It was a legitimate appointment. That's the first truth, and here's the next one. Jesus was perfected as high priest. Let me read verses 7 through 10 again, and we're back here in Hebrews 5. Verse 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, verse 9 is a very puzzling verse, I think. I wonder if it jumped out at you as we read it. The Lord Jesus, it says, was made perfect through His experience of suffering and so on. Now, if that didn't strike you as strange, I think it should have struck you as strange. How can the Lord Jesus Christ be made perfect? Isn't Jesus perfect already? As God, wasn't He perfect? perfect from all eternity past? And the answer is, and must be, of course, yes. He always was perfect. He's been perfect from all eternity. Nothing can change. Nothing can impact His perfection. That must be true if Jesus is God Himself. And so what can the writer be saying here? The word translated, being made perfect here in verse 9, it, it speaks of being completed of reaching a particular goal. It's not so much, and certainly not here, it's not about removing flaws and imperfections. It is rather about reaching a point and a goal of final completion. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we have to pause our message right there, but we'll continue to look at what it means for Jesus to be our great high priest next time. Speaking of Jesus, there's probably no greater source for us to draw closer to Him, to learn more about Him, who He is, what He has done for us, and what is true for us than the Gospels. Those first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as we dive into those Gospel books, we learn more about Jesus. We get to know our Savior better. J.C. Ryle has written a devotional book, that takes a look at these four Gospels, all four of them. And we'd love to send you a copy of this book that Jonathan recommends for a gift of any amount. You can give online and request your copy of daily readings from all four Gospels. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org or you can call and ask about this. Our toll-free number is 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Or again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, thanks for tuning in today, and I hope you'll join us next time.